the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And he has been called the guru of distributed energy. John. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction and uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm going to start off kind of like Nadav did with a little thing about smartphones. Um, but I'm just going to ask you, if you have a smartphone, can you please raise your hand? It's the interactive portion here. This will make it easy for those of you who don't. I'm looking for somebody who wants to tweet things for you. <laughs> Look for the guy who is raising their hand next to you. Um, the reason I ask this question, of course, uh, is um, that the smartphone is this remarkable technological innovation in telecommunications, um, but it has some bearing for how things have been changing in the electricity sector, which is really where I focus. When I talk about being the guru of distributed energy, it's really about electricity, which is where so much of the technological ferment is happening. Uh, in, in the current time. Um, so the second question I have for you, the second interactive portion here is, how many of you who have smartphones got them from the traditional landline phone company? A few of you, remarkable. That's more hands than I've ever seen before. It is a larger crowd than I usually speak to too, though, so that might be the reason for it. Um, but, I, but I think the reason that it's important that we look at this in this perspective and we think about what's had happening in the energy sector and the electricity sector is that the technology change that's happening right now in the electricity sector is very similar to the kind of transformational change that smartphones had um, for the telecommunications industry. So, you know, just to give an example, um, you know, the way that utilities have generated electricity for decades, uh, you know, going back to the time that Edison was starting with his first few small power plants uh, in New York City, um, was that we would burn things. We would burn oil, we would burn coal, we would burn uh, gas, that we would create heat, that it would boil water, that it would create steam, and it would turn a turbine. Or if we were very clever, we'd find those convenient locations, as Michelle was mentioning, where you could put in a dam on a river and allow the water to fall over and turn a turbine. But ultimately, in any of those cases, what you had was the same thing, which is that um, utilities learned very soon that building bigger was building better. That the larger that we made these facilities, the better the economies of scale, the lower the cost per unit of generating electricity, and um, the more cheaply and reliably we could deliver electricity. But there was also, uh, in that inherent shift toward larger uh, uh, development of energy, um, the loss of the iteration and learning process that we get when we do things very frequently. And the best I could come up with in terms of a metaphor for describing this is if you're a baker and you're trying to improve on a cake recipe, but you only bake it once every five or ten years, that it becomes harder and harder the larger scale we make things to learn from each iteration. Um, for any of you who follow, for example, the development of nuclear power plants and the supposed renaissance in nuclear uh, electricity, uh, electricity generation from nuclear power, you'll see kind of how that plays out, that we're building enormously large facilities and the learning curve is very, short, is very steep. So, um, I only have two slides. This one is meant to illustrate, in part, what kind of transformational time we're at in the electricity sector. So you can see that in the, the first part of the slide, which is really a 70-year period, there was very little happening other than we were learning to capture those economies of scale. That we've had a couple of kind of shocks to the system that are marked in red at the top in the 1970s with the energy crisis. And you can see in the yellow line there that the, the slope dramatically flattened in terms of energy use per capita. And the price of electricity started to rise really for the first time in the history of electricity generation. You had a second shock in the 1990s with deregulation and the rise of renewable energy. But what you have going on right now is really a complete transformation of the system. You have per capita electricity use completely flat. And so we're no longer planning for load growth. We're planning for uh, how do we make the system more efficient. We have prices starting to rise again. And we have these two enormously exponentially growing curves in terms of both expenditures on renewables and the capacity in, for wind and solar power, but also investments in the high voltage transmission system, which ironically um, tend to support the large scale power generation that we're familiar with from last century. So let me just go through a little bit about the kind of technology changes that are taking place in this last portion of this slide. Um, for example, distributed power, uh, power generation from solar can capture the sun anywhere. It's very fast to install. In 2014, a new solar installation was put up every 150 seconds. It's estimated that it is now once every 60 seconds. So there have been somewhere between three and four solar installations put up since I got to the podium. Um, there's a lot of learning that can happen. When you go back to that metaphor of the cake, you can, when you can iterate that fast, you can learn very quickly. And it's why the cost of solar has come down by some 80% in the past six years. Um, and, and that we are learning both to reduce the cost of the 
uh, item itself, which is modular, and we can mass produce them, but also in terms of doing the installation. We're also getting, uh, back to the smartphone, um, some remarkable new tools that can iterate in terms of distributed energy management. So I can pick up my phone right here, and with a couple of taps of my finger, raise the temperature in my house back in Minneapolis to 80 degrees. My wife and children might be a little surprised, um, but it's an important lesson in terms of the ability and the, dis the, the way that we are distributing the power to control our energy system. Um, and not only to people who, like myself, are sort of technophiles and enjoy the technology, but my 67-year-old mother has the same kind of app on her phone and can do the same thing. And again, these are software-driven tools, so again, they can iterate very quickly in a way that our traditional electricity system cannot. And we also have energy storage. We have millions of potential locations from uh, electric utility substations to building basements, and they're iterating incredibly fast in consumer electronics like smartphones, laptops, and electric vehicles, and in, in utility scale um, power generation as well. So we have all of this technology change and, and that is so different in its character from the way that we've generated power before and iterates so quickly. I tried to come up with another metaphor to describe this that would get back to that baker and this five to 10 year uh, experiments. Um, the best I could come up, come up with was too many cooks in the kitchen, but that's sort of the utility perspective, I think, um, and the way that power generation is happening. Um, but I think, you know, the, the big picture here, however, is um, in terms of how this technology changed, which is so fundamentally different from the way that electricity generation and management of the system has happened in the past hundred years, is really driving a totally different market. And so this is my second slide. And I, <laughs> I'm not going to say the words because I'm worried that I'll start singing if I start to say them. Um, but there, there are three stories of the way that this is happening. So, for example, a, a small town in, uh, called Minster, uh, Minster in Ohio, it's about 3,000 uh, people, uh, recently installed a fairly sizable solar array for their municipal utility. I think it was three or four megawatts. They had been planning to recover their costs through the uh, sale of electricity to their customers, but also through some incentives from the state of Ohio. When the state legislature, however, decided uh, in their wisdom to reduce those incentives, uh, the, the, the municipal utility was able to partner with a developer to install a battery. Um, the battery is not only going to allow them to adjust when that solar power is available to meet peak energy demand, but it also is going to provide uh, energy services back to the grid in terms of voltage regulation, frequency control, and all of the sorts of things that are very technical in the electricity industry and generally have not been provided by non-utility actors uh, in the past. And so the availability of inexpensive batteries, at least relative to what they were, uh, what they did cost, and the ability for a small uh, utility, a small town in Ohio to be providing those services to the grid are fundamentally changing the way that thing, uh, the, the grid can be managed. Another great example is in Hawaii, where 15% of households already have solar on their rooftop because it was cheaper than getting electricity from the incumbent utility. Um, to take that a step further, the Rocky Mountain Institute predicts that solar plus energy storage on a residential property in the next 10 to 20 years will likely be cheaper than solar from the incumbent utility in almost every state. So we're at this fundamental time of uh, transformation, and there's, and there's two remarkable things about that. One is just that it's incredible to think that we are getting to a point where distributed power generation can be cost competitive with utility scale generation um, and in such a short time frame. But the second thing is that in terms of the utility planning cycle, when a utility plans a new power plant, they intend for it to operate for 40 to 50 years. And what the research is telling them right now is that thing's going to be obsolete halfway through its uh, planned lifetime by solar and energy storage. They can be built in a distributed fashion and owned by the customers. So. What we have really happening in the electricity sector right now is energy monopoly giving way to energy democracy. Um, I, I really like coming up with metaphors for people who I, I'm often talking to non-technical audiences. I think that's not the case today. Um, but I, the best I could come up with for this one is if you think about you know, something as simple as a toilet, which operates exactly the same way that you hope it operates every single time. And it's sort of like there's a fountain of water coming up out of it now for the utilities. That, that what, what had reliably always been a one-way system and had worked the same way every single time is now working in a totally new and different way. Um, and it's really quite shocking. <laughs> so the system that we're in then that is so fundamentally different um, really requires some new rules and some new thinking about how we provide electricity services. 
Um, you know, if power generation and management isn't a monopoly system anymore, you know, we, we have an electric grid. We had a good reason to have a monopoly when we were building it because we didn't really want multiple grids. But at this point, we have one. It's built out. It connects all of the properties that we have. If managing that system isn't a monopoly, that I can do things for my smartphone, if I can put solar on my rooftop and have all of those uh, and control all of that locally, why should we have utility monopolies in the way that we have had them before? It's a public policy question now an open question about whether or not that market structure makes sense. You know, you know, another way to look at this is that we spend collectively about $360 billion a year on electricity purchases in the United States. And the question for communities might be, why can't we keep more of that within our community instead of sending it out, whether that's for power purchases from a fossil fuel power plant that's many miles away, um, or simply to a utility company that has shareholders uh, in distant places. And so what are the rules then that we can have that will enable that diffusion of control and of ownership and also to do so do that for everyone and not just wealthy folks. Michelle alluded to that in her presentation that one of the challenges that we have is that we can demonopolize the electricity system but we don't necessarily democratize it at the same time. And that is really the challenge is that the electric grid is going to a sort of 2.0 but could it end up simply like the smartphone companies or the phone companies, you know, one of the things I find so funny about this is that you know, they broke up the AT&T landline monopoly so long ago, AT&T is now one of the two largest providers of mobile phone services. You know, it's been rebranded and, you know, there's been all this shifting around. Getting to energy democracy isn't inevitable. Um, but we do have a remarkable opportunity uh, to examine the rules of the system, to take advantage of the technological transformation and to see where it will lead us. Thank you.